At this very moment, a constellation of 150 toaster-sized satellites is orbiting 400 kilometers above us, capturing the entire Earth's landmass on an array of miniature cameras that are only advanced and affordable enough because of your smartphone's massive supply chain. Every tropical storm, every peaceful protest, every whale migration. At this very moment, a farmer in Africa is using remote sensors and weather models to help her decide whether to plant carrots or cassavas next season. And at this very moment, a 3,000-year-old pyramid lies meters beneath the desert sand, patiently waiting to be rediscovered by a scientist sitting in her lab in Birmingham, Alabama. Welcome to Prepare.ai's Our Planet and Beyond. Hi, my name is Ranbir Chandra, and today I will talk about work that we have been doing at Microsoft around enabling data-driven agriculture. So why are we doing it? Well, the world has a food problem. The world's food production needs to increase significantly to feed the growing population of the world. And it is not just about feeding the world. It's about giving them good food, nutritious food. And towards that goal, we have been looking at various approaches to address that problem. And this is why I have started this project called Farm Beats in 2015. To give you some background about myself, my background is not in agriculture. I'm a PhD in computer science from Cornell University. That said, um, I did spend a lot of time growing up with my grandparents. They lived in Bihar, which is one of the poorest states in India, in northern part of India. And every summer and winter vacation, I would spend with them. Back then, I did not like agriculture. These farms, they did not have any electricity, they did not have any toilets. But that was where I spent a lot of time growing up. Even though I did not like that time, in hindsight, that moment, those, those few months every year, did expose me to the most primitive forms of agriculture that has been used in those parts of the world, to a lot of poverty. And that has been the thread of my research at Microsoft. And in 2018 is when I moved from Microsoft Research to the product side to ship some of the technologies that I have been working on as a product. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So why are we doing this? As I said before, the world needs more food to feed the growing population. It's not just about more food. It's about good food, nutritious food. And we need to grow this food without harming the planet, even though the soils are not getting any richer, the water levels are going down, yet we need to increase this significant food production. So how do we get there? The most promising approach is that of data-driven agriculture. What do we mean by data-driven agriculture? We mean the ability to capture large amounts of data from farms, and once you get this data, to use this data to drive insights. For example, you can map every farm in the world and overlay this farm with data. For example, what is the soil moisture level, the soil nutrient level throughout the farm at a very minute scale. If you could build accurate maps like this, it would enable many new scenarios. For example, it would enable precision agriculture. You could apply water only where it is needed, pesticide only where it is needed, nutrients only where it is needed. And as many of you here know, precision agriculture has been shown to improve yields has been shown to reduce cost because you use less water, less pesticide. It's also better for the environment for the same reasons. That is, you're not wasting water, you're not wasting pesticide, you're not wasting nutrients. The other benefit of this is, for example, in the context of phenotyping. That is, if you could build maps like this per farm, you can understand why did the same seed variety grow differently in different parts of the farm. For example, the red versus the green versus the yellow parts of the farm. And if you can do that, you can then use it to create phenotypes that work better, these new genotypes that would work best in any particular farm in the world. In fact, there are many new scenarios that could be enabled if you could start doing data-driven farming, data-driven agriculture. You could have connected farms, you could have advisories that you provide insights to growers about what to do at what point in time. You could have traceability, you can track a crop, track a produce as it is going from the farm to the consumer. There are many, many scenarios. However, despite the fact that the benefits 
of data and data-driven agriculture are well known. These technologies haven't taken off. And the biggest reason they haven't taken off is the cost of existing data-driven agriculture solutions. That is, even if, if I just give you an example, I was um, at an expo a few years back and there were several companies talking about the best uh, uh, equipment, precision ag equipment, and the cheapest package included five sensors and the total cost was $8,000 and a recurring cost per year. For most growers, what is the ROI? If I put in, if I buy five sensors and that's it, is they won't be able to recover the cost at that point. So that is what triggered the start of the Farm Beats project. The goal of the Farm Beats project is to make these data-driven agriculture solutions much more affordable than where they are now. And I'll talk about a few innovations that we're doing to significantly bring down the cost of these solutions to make them more affordable for farmers worldwide. The first solution that we have is around farm connectivity. That is, the challenge is that of farm connectivity. Even though the farmer's house has some sort of connectivity to the cloud, the actual farm could be a few miles away. Even though connectivity might exist when the farmer first plants the seeds, by the time the crops grow, the connectivity is gone. So then the question is, if you don't have good connectivity from the farm to the farmer's house, how will you send large amounts of data from the middle of the farm to the farmer's house? To address this problem, we use a technology that I personally have been working on for over, um, well, since 2005. This technology is called the TV white spaces. What the TV white spaces enables is, imagine if you had a Wi-Fi router and you could access it a few miles away. That would be cool, right? Right now, as soon as you exit your house, your Wi-Fi is gone. And the way we do that, the way we enable this kind of connectivity is by taking these Wi-Fi signals and putting them in empty TV channels. This is TV you watch using over-the-air antenna. You know, when you're, uh, when you're browsing through, through TV, on certain channels, you get a transmission. On the other channels, all you see is white noise. The particular technology we had built back in 2009 for which we got the best paper award at the top tier networking conference was a way to overlay these Wi-Fi signals, put these Wi-Fi signals in these empty TV channels in a way that doesn't interfere with your TV reception in an adjacent channel. And if you can do this, the key advantage is that at the same power level in UHF TV channels, your signals would go four times faster, your Wi-Fi signals. In VHF, the channels, your Wi-Fi signals would travel 12 times farther. That's in free space. Once you put in trees, crops, canopies, your signals would just keep going through. So back in the day in 2010, the FCC chairman had come to see some of one of the demos we had put together in August of 2010. In October, this was made legal in the US. Since then, this technology has been made legal in US, UK, Canada, Singapore, Brazil, various countries worldwide. And in 2017, Microsoft launched a new initiative called the Airband Initiative, through which Microsoft is partnering with ISVs, with, with, with ISPs, these internet service providers, and uh, partnering with other ecosystem players and, and the government as well to bring broadband to rural America and actually rural communities worldwide. For America, we've made a pledge to connect 3 million rural Americans to broadband by 2022. And we are doing these kind of partnerships in various parts of the world, working on business models, making investments to get broadband to different parts of the world. The second challenge with, uh, the, by the way, before I go here, the other interesting thing about TV white spaces is that the TV towers are where people are in, uh, in cities, like for example, in Seattle, in Ottawa, in other cities. The farms are away from the cities. So if you turn on a TV in the middle of a farm, most of the channels will be white noise. Even if 20 TV channels in a farm are available, are white noise, we are talking of about half a gigabit per second of available capacity in the middle of a farm. At which point, at half a gigabit, you're not just talking about connecting sensors, you could be connecting drones, cameras, streaming a lot of information that you just couldn't get from the middle of the farm. So with the TV white spaces, we can bring down the cost of connectivity, of sensors, of drone connectivity. The second challenge is 
if you had to build a map like this, for example, what is the soil moisture level six inches below the soil throughout the farm, you would need lots and lots of sensors. For example, you would need a sensor every 10 meters. But putting a sensor every 10 meters is expensive to deploy, to manage. It will come in the way of the farmer as the farmer does the day-to-day -day job. So the key question we asked was the last bullet you're seeing on the screen here. Can we make a map like this using very few sensors? To address this problem, we decided to use drones. These are UAVs that have a camera at the bottom. You can buy them for about $1,000 and they can cover large areas very quickly. And the key technology we built was a way to use artificial intelligence to use the aerial imagery to interpolate the sensor values at other parts of the farm. The way the system works is once you put the sensors in the ground, we then use the aerial image to then learn the model based on where the sensors are and then use that machine learning model to predict these values in other parts of the farm where you do not have sensors. Our key technology is built on two key insights. First is what we call spatial smoothness. That is, if two parts of the farm are close to each other, they're likely to have similar values. And the second is visual similarity. That is, if two parts of the farm look similar, not just in RGB, but in multispectral or hyperspectral values, they're likely to have similar values. And we encode both of these insights in two different kernel functions in a machine learning model and we use that to start making these predictions. While this idea is cool, drones are great. Drones work well in, de in the developed world, for example, here in the US, in Canada. If you look at um, Sub-Saharan Africa or India, drones are still expensive. They still cost over $1,000. They have limited battery life. Most of the drones that you buy still, um, they, uh, they last only 30 to 35 minutes on a single flight. They also have regulatory concerns. In some countries where we had to fly drones, we needed to get permission from the Ministry of Defense, which wasn't going to happen. So then the question was, if you can't use drones, is there another way in which you can get the aerial image of the farm at low cost? To address this problem, we decided to go low tech. We are using helium filled balloons. These are four to five feet in diameter. This is tethered to the ground, goes up 150 to 200 feet. What we built was this mount, a weatherproof mount, where you could put your smartphone with your camera facing down and a battery pack attached to it. And this thing can stay up from four to seven days taking images of the same part of the farm. And this, so for example, there is this farm here close to Microsoft campus, about 25 miles east of Microsoft campus, where we do several demos there. Bill Gates had come there. He had blogged about this farm and the technology in Gates Notes. So if any one of you are visiting the Seattle area, do let me know, would love to take you, show you, demonstrate to you how this technology works. So this farmer, there's a smallholder farmer, every winter, his farm, his farm is next to the river. And every winter when there is floods in the river, his farm gets flooded. When he comes every morning, if he sees any amount of flood in the farm, he will throw away his entire crop because based on regulations, he's not allowed to sell any crop that is touched by the flood. With this technology, because this can stay up from four to seven days, he can see which crops are actually touched by the flood and only throws away those crops. And in fact, you can do much more in places like India and Africa where labor is inexpensive. Somebody could just walk around with the balloon. And then what we've done is we use computer vision algorithms to stitch these images together to create a needle view and auto mosaic of the entire farm. While drones and balloons are great, you can get some images for some farms. For most of the farms, we won't have this kind of a high resolution image. So then for those farms, we do need satellite imagery. But one of the big problems with satellite imagery is that, as many of you know, 77% of satellite imagery has clouds. So if most of the satellite images have clouds in them, how can we, how can we then still use to get current imagery, aerial imagery for these farms. To address this problem, we've developed a new technique called SpaceEye. SpaceEye, what it does, it looks at different satellites. There's a satellite that has SAR uh, radar information. This radar RF signals go through the clouds and reflect differently from different surfaces. And we use that along with optical imagery to reconstruct the imagery below the clouds. For example, what you're seeing here is on the left, 
what we get with state of the art. On the right is what we are able to reconstruct using SpaceI. As you can see, even though the images are cloudy, we can see the farm changing when the farmer has tilled the farm, when emergence is happening, you can start getting latest information for the farm. So the way the system works then is you get aerial imagery from drones or balloons, you create an orthomosaic. If you have satellite imagery, you're getting the aerial image as is. Then you take the sparse sensor data in the farm and then use that to train your machine learning model for those sparse locations and then use that trained model to predict these values in other parts of the farm. And we've done this for aerial imagery, as I said, from drones, satellites, or balloons. And then we've created these maps for soil moisture, for soil pH, soil temperature. And we are able to, in the research paper that we wrote on this, we showed that using aerial imagery, these kind of maps at, at a fine resolution can be three times more accurate than existing schemes that do not use aerial imagery. The third challenge, I talked about how with the TV white spaces, you can reduce the cost of each sensor. With the AI algorithm I just talked about, you need much fewer sensors than what you would otherwise need to build these kind of maps for the farms. The third challenge is the lack of cloud connectivity. That is, you can get a lot of information from the farm to the farmer's house, but the connectivity from the farm to the cloud is weak. Many farmers, they pay for broadband, but all they get is one to three megabits per second connection. And this connectivity is also prone to outages. That is, there's this farm in upstate New York. Every time there is a snowstorm, there's a high likelihood that his internet connection goes off. So given this challenge, the question then is, how will you, if you cannot really connect to the cloud, how will you bring the benefits of all of this data to the farmers? Well, before we went to address this problem, what we did was we asked the question, we did a survey to find out what services can we provide if you start getting this data, if you can start merging all of these data streams, what kind of services can you start providing to the farmers? I'll walk you through a simple example. These are some, uh, a few different input streams that we could support. We can get data from weather stations, drones, cameras, sensors, or nodes. And in this simple example, suppose you have data from drones, you can create and get image samples. You can use those to create an orthomosaic of the entire farm. You can get a few sensor readings. You can combine sensor data with drone imagery to create these heat maps of farms. You can then take that with the predicted weather forecast. Say for example, you have a soil moisture map and you have the weather forecast. You can use it to do intelligent irrigation scheduling. And not only that, if you look at it, when we started talking to agronomists and industry people and faculty farmers, they, we realized there are a whole lot of services that you can start building on top of, these, uh, uh, of this input data. Actually, if you look at this data, this is the amount of data that you're generating from each farm on a daily basis. And in fact, it could be much more based on what other input streams you're looking at and the size of the farm. But sending all of this data to the cloud is going to take forever. But the thing is, you don't really need to send all of this data to the cloud because depending on the service, some data needs to go right away. The others can be sent much later. For example, if you're querying sensor data, you probably want that data. You want to know the latest information. What is that data right now? If you're monitoring livestock, you want to get alerted as soon as, say, for example, the cow uh, goes outside the fence. There's, a, there's actually an, uh, an interesting kind of funny use case with one of the growers that we work with. He told us that, well, a cat, there is a bear, a black bear, not a, not, not a grizzly bear, a black bear that comes to his farm. And just before harvest, it will eat up all the red lettuce and won't even touch the green lettuce next to it. So his point was, well, as soon as you see the bear, can you send me a notification? Well, we need to send that notification very quickly because if we send it a few hours later, the bear would have done the damage. Similarly, for irrigation schedules, you could wait a few hours. For applying chemicals, you could wait a few hours, even a day. To decide what to plant the next season, you could wait a few days, even a week, and that should be fine. So in the real world, typically you would send all of this information to the, to the cloud and then do the analysis, but you can't really do it for agriculture because of two key reasons. As I said before, the connectivity is weak and it's also prone to outages. So to address this problem, 
what we did, our key insight was that most farmers have PCs. If they don't have a PC, we ship them a PC form factor device, which sits in the farmer's house, doing a lot of compute in the farmer's house. And then it sends the summaries to the cloud where we then merge with other data streams from uh, weather station satellites and use that to create insights for the growers. If you double click on the edge device, Everything you're seeing in this gray box is what's running on the edge. It could get data from sensors, from drones, it does ortho mosaicing, it combines it to do sensor fusion. It also syncs all of this data lazily to the cloud. We also support cameras which stream data over the white spaces to the edge device where we do deep learning on the edge. What you're seeing on the rightmost column is not something that we at Microsoft would do. We are not the experts, but we would work with partners to build those solutions in the far right. In addition to this, there's unique storage on the Edge device, and this can also be accessed offline through a web server. One of the interesting things about this slide is that all the green boxes would be running in Docker containers. So if you have great connectivity to the cloud, you could just pick a Docker container and move it to the cloud as opposed to running it on the Edge device. So we've deployed the system in various farms worldwide and uh, these are just some examples all the way from half an acre to a 9,000 acre farm. And these are some of the use cases. This is a farm in, uh, th this is one of the scenarios that we enable with Palm Beach is microclimate forecasting. What this does is if you, once you put a sensor in the farm, at that point, we not only tell you what the sensor readings are, but we could also make predictions of what these sensor values would be up to five days in advance. And the, here, for example, on the right, you are seeing uh, for these graphs for soil moisture and soil temperature. And if you look at the red bar, the error is less than 8%. The way we built this was we took data from 50 weather stations across Washington state. We used that over the last seven years at 15 minute intervals. We used that to train the model. And then we use that trained model to make very hyper-local predictions. On the bottom left, you're seeing a testimonial from a farmer. You'll see his video in a bit. He used this to, he was looking to spray chemicals in his farm and uh, was spray, uh, before spraying, he looked at the predicted weather forecast. The weather station said it was going to be 42 degrees. We predicted it was going to be 31. It was actually 30. It was good that he didn't spray chemicals in the farm when it was below freezing because it would have damaged the crop. This is another use case I like talking about. This is a farm in upstate New York where the farmer wanted to know how his cows are doing once they're out in pasture. So we flew the drone, we transmitted the data over the white spaces to an edge device and within 30 minutes we could start flagging things like the grass is growing back well from left to right, there is a water puddle that needs to be fixed before the next planting season, the cows are pooping well which is also important information for the farmer for deep learning enthusiasts out there this is deep learning on cow poop this is where the cows are this is a stray cow that needs to be herded in all of this within 30 minutes of flying the drone this is the farm close to microsoft campus we show the farmer these beautiful pictures and overlay it with data for example this is a soil moisture map we were able to flag that the bottom left parts of the farm are still moist even though we did not have a sensor over there. This is after the farmer had applied lime, we were able to flag that the dark parts of the farm, the dark parts in the image are still acidic and the farmer should reapply lime before planting the seeds. This is another scenario where we have uh, cameras in barns streaming data over the white spaces to an edge device where we see how the cows are moving, whether a cow is sick or not and flag this information to the farmer. If you think of the last scenario, it's difficult to see how you would transmit all that data without TV white spaces, or if you did not have an edge, how would you send all that camera data? So um, everything I talked about until now was in research until 2018. We did a lot of work. We, did, we deployed this in various farms in different countries. But then we moved I moved over to the product side and we shipped our first version of the product, Azure Farm Beats, which doesn't have to be uh, completely clear, it doesn't have all the components I talked about. We are working on some of them, we've shipped some of them. And the way it's available right now, we announced Azure Farm Beats as a product, it's in public preview, In we announced it in November last year. It's available in Azure Marketplace. You could go to any, um, if you go to Azure Marketplace, you can install Azure Farm Beats. Once you install Azure Farm Beats, it would set up two resource groups. One is for the data hub, the other is for the accelerator. 
The data hub is one place in the cloud where you can see all the data for your farms. So inside data hub with APIs, you can create uh, a field or a plot. And for that field or plot, you can then start linking in sensors, drones, satellites, weather stations, all of that. The, um, in this slide, everything you're seeing in blue is what's coming with Azure. Everything in this shade of green is what we do with Farm Beats and everything in yellow is what is done by our partners. So for example, once you create a field or a plot, you can connect sensors to it. You can link sensors and the sensors, uh, some of the sensor companies we support right now are from Davis Instruments, from uh, Pestle Instruments. And you can then start getting that information into Data Hub. Same with drones. We have, we support drones from, uh, uh, we, we support, uh, uh, we, have part, we, we have partnered with DJI and with uh, Parrot and we support drones from them. We have Sentinel data for whether we also, we support NOAA as well as DTN. And all of that information comes into Data Hub. The other interesting thing about Data Hub is that it's integrated with Azure Notebooks. What this means is that for all the data scientists out there who use Python, who, uh, who are familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, can now start coming and start writing AI algorithms on top. We also support some of the AI models I talked about. For example, we combine sensor data with aerial imagery say from satellites, to merge them, to start building these maps, the you know, soil moisture maps for any farm. The way this uh, farm beats, it's, farm beats is not meant to be directly for the grower. It's meant for, uh, to get to the grower through ISVs and partners. That would be many of the companies that are in the audience today. We would love to work with you where you can start building these solutions on top. And some of these bubbles you're seeing on the top right using which you can then take these solutions to the growers. A lot of the AI that you have to do, a lot of the data ingestion that you have to do, a lot of the undifferentiated heavy lifting that you have to do, we could be supporting it on Microsoft's Farm Beats platform, on top of which you can then build your solutions and take it to the agricultural community. So if you, to summarize, the key thing about Farm Beats is not only the ability to ingest data from different types of data sources, but what we also do is we do a lot of pre-processing, we make your AI faster, we provide some of the AI tools using which you can start bringing in the power of artificial intelligence to the, the technology is appealing. If you think there are partnerships that we could do, would love to see how we could make that work. So while some of the technologies I talked about are shipping, we are continuing to invest in technologies to make data-driven agriculture even more affordable, even more usable. And one of the things we've built is a technology called Strobe, using which uh, we can, this is still in the very early stages, we're looking at whether we can use Wi-Fi to sense soil. That is, right now there are sensors out there in the market that measure soil moisture or soil DC, but the good sensors still cost hundreds of dollars, which for most farmers, especially if you look at farmers in Sub-Saharan Africa or in Asia, Southeast Asia, they won't spend a few hundred dollars for a sensor. But that said, many of them still have a smartphone, even if it is an inexpensive one. Even for an inexpensive smartphone, it still has a Wi-Fi chip. So the key question we asked was, can we use Wi-Fi chipsets to start measuring soil moisture and soil EC? One of the, uh, the, the key idea was that the time of flight of a Wi-Fi signal, the time it takes from the time it leaves your phone to the time it gets to another point depends on the permittivity of the material. So if your soil is moist, it would take longer to traverse the same distance. However, this time is of the order of nanoseconds and it's very hard to measure that using the amount of bandwidth that's there in Wi-Fi. So instead, the, the, uh, the key idea we came up with was that most of these Wi-Fi chipsets that you have right now have multiple antennas. So instead of measuring absolute time of flight, there's some intelligent techniques using which you can measure the relative time of flight and amplitude based on which you can estimate both soil moisture and soil EC. We published this paper last year and this got, uh, this got an award at a top tier computer science conference as a way in which we could really bring down the cost of sensing in the future. This is of course the very first time anyone has shown it. There's more work to be done in this space, but we were super excited and super bullish on this idea that in the future, you could really democratize sensing. You could start getting very detailed measurements from farms worldwide. 
Another technology that we're investing in is what we call Gaudi, which is a way to um, build 3D models of farms. When we were doing, uh, when we were building the product, even now we get approached by several drone companies who are building very cool AI algorithms, AI models, to measure a lot of things in the farm. For example, things like leaf area index, crop stress. The question is, how do we know whether a particular model works well or not? We could go sample it in a few farms, but for things like leaf area index, you really can't go and pluck every leaf in the farm and dry it out to see what the actual leaf area index was for all the leaves in the farm. Instead, what we did was we created a 3D simulation, a realistic simulation of the farm, as what you're seeing here, where this is physics space simulator. It models weather, sun, wind. It, uh, you can also change the crop height, the crop spacing, the crop stress. And once you change all of this, what you can do is you can then fly a drone in this um, or, or put the camera on a tractor and view this farm in simulations. And you can do this not just for, you can create a farm anywhere in the world using this technology. You can create different farms. You can use it to validate the model. You can use it to get new kinds of data. You can see how the model would perform in different conditions, for example, in different light conditions. You can use it to retrain the model and make the model better. So this tool is something that we are continuing to build on to, to, build, to be able to create a farm of of wherever you want to test your algorithm, both for, uh, you can use it both for data generation, for validation of the models. You can also use it for automation of a lot of robotics, for example, for tractors and drones. So at Microsoft, I talked about a lot of the research we are doing of continuing to push the boundaries of data-driven agriculture. How do we get farmers worldwide to start using data and data-driven insights? to start taking decisions. In addition to research, we are continuing to work on products. I talked about Azure Farm Beats, there are others that we are building. And through some of our CSR initiatives, we are actually working on taking it all the way to the farmers to see what we can do in partnership with some of, our, some of the other companies to take it all the way to create actual societal impact. For example, with uh, the AI for Earth, we are initiative, what we do is we give out grants to any organization that is using uh, AI to solve some of the world's hardest problems around water, biodiversity, climate change, and agriculture. Through the Airband initiative, we, I talked about that, how we are investing in bringing the benefits of broadband to rural communities worldwide. Through the TechSpark initiative, through Microsoft Philanthropies, for example, we are looking to bridge the skill gap in the rural parts of the world, where we, we are partnering with organizations such as 4-H, with FFA, with the Future Farmers of America. And what we've done, one of the things we've done is we've created a Farm Beat student kit that we give out to high schools, where these high schools then create a curriculum using these student kits. The key goal there is we want to start young. We want to get farmers while they are future farmers, while they are in high school, to start learning about data, how they can incorporate data and data-driven insights into their day-to-day -day agricultural practices. In addition to these, we've also, uh, through M12, we've made our first ag tech investment, and we're continuing to look at agriculture in a holistic way. There are some partners that are already using farm beats. For example, last week, we announced a deep partnership with Lander Lakes, where with Lander Lakes, we're looking to partner on broadband, on sustainability, on uh, farm beats as well for, for a lot of the insights, a lot of the digital tools that Lander Lakes has would be built on top of Azure and Azure Farm Beats. We've also done, announced partnerships with the USDA, with CSIRO in Australia, and we are continuing to work with all the partners, all the leaders in this space who are working with farmers, who are leading the way in agriculture and empowering them with technology, with the different technologies that we've built at Microsoft on the cloud, on the edge, on AI, on communications, all of it and bringing it with our partners to the leading agricultural institutes worldwide. So to conclude, that is what Farm Beats is. This is uh, through which we are learning. We are working with some of the key partners and key customers. And we look forward to working with all of you as we work on helping transform agriculture to be more data-driven worldwide. Thank you. Ranveer, hello. That was 
Excellent, uh, excellent talk. I have a ton of questions from the audience and, uh, and of my own that I've, I've kind of cataloged here. So uh, this is great. So everybody who has attended uh, our final keynote here, uh, thank you, Dr. Rambir Chandra. Um, we're gonna dig into some live Q&A here. And if you have more questions, please get into the Whova app and uh, type them in and we'll, we'll try to surface them. Uh, so Rambir, the, the first question I have for you is, is there such a thing as a starter pack for precision agriculture? Like, would you, recommend a typical commercial farmer do they get you know you were mentioning a small pack of five sensors do you get 10 do you get do you need a base station do you need a drone like what what do you get going with and do you buy that do you lease it do you rent it right right no that's a great question dave and especially thinking thinking about it from a grower's perspective right what is it that i need to get started and part of it right now is and in fact this is how i encourage uh, people to, to even use farm beats initially, not, not really growers, but people who are deploying ag tech solutions on top of farm beats, is a grower can start with just using remote sensing, that is using data from satellites and then start seeing satellite and weather stations for which you don't really need anything in the farm, but you can get started with some sort of insights. Of course, to take you to the next level, you would need things in the farm. You would need at least to start with one weather station that can tell you what's happening at that location. Beyond that, if you need more data from different parts of the farm, then what I would recommend is in farm beats, one of the things we, we include was an AI model that tells you where should you be placing sensors in the farm. That is, if I have a farm, not the entire farm is heterogeneous. If I'm putting, say, soil sensors, I don't need to be putting sensors everywhere, but you should be intelligently placing the sensors in the more different parts of the farm, but if two parts of the farm look very similar, you don't really need sensors in both those locations. So you do intelligent sensor placement, and then you could start putting the soil sensors in the farm. So to start with, as I was saying, remote sensing is the basic thing. You don't need anything in the farm, start with that. Next level would be to try out a weather station, which would really be helpful with not just telling you weather at that location, but being able to do these microclimate predictions in addition to that. And the third would be soil sensors. Of course, along with that, you should try to get as much data as you can from the farm equipment, for example, from your tractors, which also gives a lot of information that you can build on. And finally, of, of course, drones can, uh, uh, drones or some sort of aerial imagery can, that's low high, low altitude aerial imagery can then start flagging new insights, which you otherwise wouldn't have gotten. So that would be the complete package, of course, and then there are many more which are futuristic, which people talk about with, with robotics, with automation, but at least this can get people started. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I love what you were talking about. Um, so, so starter pack, I love when you were talking about the mobile phone, right? Like so many small farmers globally, uh, you know, they, they just have a, motor, a mobile phone, which in itself is, is a leap forward for, for a lot of these, these folks technology wise. Um, but when you're talking about this, like the full suite of solutions, that, that would be if like, you know, maybe a commercial agribusiness in a developed country uh, how much of the vision that you're talking about can be realized with just someone with a with a smartphone? Uh, and is there, you know, one of the things I'm thinking about that's related to this is how how close do the sensor base stations need to be? So, say uh, in a a, uh, a poor rural territory in you know the, the Western United States, the government subsidizes and sets up here. Here's a big uh, sensor station. And then you can use that to interpolate uh, out to uh, to folks and use that. W would that even work, or is or does the range need to to be closer? No, that could work, and that's the model which we are thinking of, even for like sub-Saharan Africa or, in, or India or Southeast Asia, where a lot of farmers are small farmers, and they, these are not the more like they they are uh, they are economically challenged communities. And for those communities, we need to think of the next stage, next step forward. I think where we are right now, it would work for mid to large size farms, like tens of acres and beyond. But if you have sub acre, you need something more. And like what you're talking about, an infrastructure investment in say a network or an IoT system, which makes it really inexpensive for people to put sensors or would, would really help kickstart uh, the system. And of course, having a mobile phone is a big step forward, as you said, right? That allows a lot of growers to start getting 
insights, they get the benefits of the internet. They, they already start getting some of that. But beyond that, there's a lot more that can be done about providing insights. Like for example, there are companies where growers can go and take pictures of their farms. And based on the pictures, you can start identifying for example, from leaves, if there is a pest infestation, if there's a disease and start flagging that information to the grower. So there are techniques that people are building and a lot more needs to be done though to make these uh, the smallholder farmers also adopt digital agriculture solutions. I think we need to do a lot more in that space. Great, that's very helpful. Um, so what are the, what is the potential for the, the gains that precision agriculture can add? You know, you began your talk talking talking about uh, there's a food shortage, right? If, if everybody realizes that this vision that you're talking about, does that solve it fully? Does it solve it partially? Do we need to do other things to get to that vision of food security? Yeah, no, that's a good question, uh, Dave, as to would this, would, this help, would this completely solve the problem? I don't think so. I think there is more to be done, like addressing the problem of food waste is an important one if we need to get there, right? And here I was just talking about the production side of things, but you also need to look at food waste and making sure that the food is not wasted either on the farm or post harvest, but while it gets to the retail stores, like in the US, a lot of the food in the retail stores goes to go waste. Mm -hmm. So how do you prevent that? And technology has a role to play over there too. If you can start say merging uh, the, the operations research based models with, uh, with say biological models. I was just talking to a, a, a student in Florida University of Florida this morning, who, where she was talking about how you could then start modeling when a produce is going to go waste, either in, in transit from the farm to the retail store or in the retail store if it's kept a certain number of days. So we need more and more research in this space too, too. but I think the digital agriculture will help address part of the problem on production ag. It will also help growers be more profitable. It will help increase sustainability. Those are all side benefits. But in addition to that, we also need to address the food waste problem, which I did not talk about in today's talk, but that is also an important problem. A lot of companies are working in this space. A lot of researchers are working in this space. And I think we all need to come together to, 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 to change that, to, to impact this, this problem. That's great, thank you. So there's one more here from the, the audience. Um, how can you deter determine what a reliable data set is when year to year changes or even day to day, the, the lighting, seed variety, what sort of baselines and... and um, yeah. yeah, that's one of the hardest problems in agriculture, right? If you look at AI, artificial intelligence, it's taking off much faster in some of the other industries, but is lagging in the agriculture space. We talk a lot about, yeah, we have a lot of data. We have a lot of remote sensing data, but you really don't know what the ground truth is. And that is one of the, the quality of the data has been an issue. Now, both fronts. One, we don't have good label data. People have tried to get data from the farm, but then again, you don't know the quality of the data. Like one of the things, uh, this was a session I was doing with uh, the Gates Foundation and a few other organizations about being able to collect data from nonprofits. Say there are a lot of nonprofits in, in say Sub-Saharan Africa, they could be collecting data and providing the data, but how do you know that data is good, that data is accurate? The sensors, for example, are calibrated. We don't have that information. And that is one of the big issues in, in agriculture. And we've seen this before in other domains as well. For example, in the weather space and weather predictions, the weather data from, in, from India, for example, historically hasn't been good. In the US and in some of the other, in the developed world, we get high quality weather data over the last 30 years. It's not the case, in, for example, in places like India. So how do you then start making sense with data that is not very reliable? And I think this is something where we need to add and when we are thinking of data, part of the, the data processing, pre-processing pre for AI needs to be on checking the data quality, whether the data quality is good. And there are a few ways in which you can do it. You can cross correlate things. For example, if it has rained and the soil moisture data hasn't gone up, well, something is anomalous, right? You need to discard that data. And similarly, you need to start looking at multimodal streams and do some anomaly detection to filter out the data that is not accurate, which you can then use to then drive your AI, more, AI algorithms. But this problem of data fidelity, data accuracy is something that needs to be addressed because to some extent, your AI models are as good as your data. If your data is messed up, your AI models will get messed up. And that is something we really need to address uh, in agriculture. And if there are people working in this space, any of the attendees 
would love to uh, have a chat with them to see how we can address that problem. Excellent. That is a great place to end it. Ranveer, thank you so much. <laughs> this wraps up our uh, keynote session for our day two. Uh, so thanks everybody, all the attendees for, for joining. Uh, another incredible day of content. Uh, thanks for being here and contributing to our dialogue today. Uh, let's keep the conversation going. Hang out in the Whova app. We got chat rooms, the expo hall. Uh, there's Q and A here. Uh, see what people are talking about. Ask a question. Weigh in with a comment. You know, one of the things that we value very highly here at Prepare AI is openness. Uh, so please weigh in. Uh, we'll be back next week with more compelling sessions on health and well-being. Uh, and remember, our generous sponsors and founders have made this event free and open to all. So why not tell a friend? Have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.